Welcome back. Toronto's mayoral race is nearly over and we have been featuring the seven leading candidates on the show for one on one interviews all week long. And first up this morning, we hear from City Councillor Josh Matlow. Councillor Matlow, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here, Tammy. Uh, first off, I want to ask what made you want to make this jump? Uh, you've been a councillor for over a decade now and yeah. you making this jump. I know that there have been calls for you to do so even during the last election. Yeah, yeah. Why now? Well, I, mean, I think it's fair to say that none of us expected that this by-election would happen, uh, to, to understate it. But I've been advocating for uh, real ways to improve safety, housing affordability, and improving our services, whether it be snow clearing to helping our most vulnerable, really addressing the homelessness crisis, uh, to getting our roads repaired, uh, to getting our kids into rec programs. And I have not been satisfied with the leadership that we've had at City Hall for many years. And this was an opportunity to step up and advocate for a plan that I believe in. Um, and unlike, you know, a lot of the the promises that are made during elections that are, you know, I think pandering, uh, you know, everyone's uh, promised a unicorn or the streets paved with gold. I have a plan that is realistic, that's costed, that I show you, quite honestly, how I'm going to pay for things right up front. And I even have the uh, former parliamentary budget officer of Canada, Kevin Page, who's reviewed it and he's verified that, it, that what I'm saying is real. And I just hope that Torontonians are obviously more engaged. I hope that there's better voter turnout. And if they look at my plan in the substance of it, the reality of it versus the promises that others are making, they will see that I'm there to improve our lives. I mean, that's what I want to do as mayor. I'm actually more excited about the work as mayor than the role. Um, and Ultimately, there's going to be polls that are put out by various campaigns. There's going to be pundits who are going to have various opinions. But ultimately, it's going to be up to Toronto residents who they want to represent them and who they really believe will do the work that they're saying they want to do. Now, you mentioned your fully costed platform yes. and your plan that you've already released. Some of it does rely on more support from the provincial and the federal governments. How do you think you will work especially with the provincial government that's in power right now? Well, the reality of our budget is that we have a $1.5 billion shortfall. And John Tory rated the reserves, so that means that the cupboards are bare. So we've got a financial crisis. We're going to need to do a combination of a, uh, a tax increase above inflation. I've offered 2%, which really comes down to $5.55 a month per average homeowner. It's something that most people can absorb, but what it'll do is bring in $490 million over the next, or $390 million rather, over the next five years to start improving the services that have declined for far too long. We're also going to need to manage our budget better and address, uh, you know, some of the spending that I think is questionable and we need to improve on that. And then, yes, we need a better deal with the province and the federal government, but the, the go-along to get-along approach that City Hall has been using has failed us. Like John Tory was able to get strong mayor powers, but we were left with a weaker Toronto. We have less power. We have less money. The TTC was cut. It's less safe. It's less reliable. It's less affordable. We can do better. So my approach is going to be to demand that Doug Ford treat us like a partner. I'm going to go in with a position of strength. And that also includes telling Doug Ford that we're going to fight back if he tries to privatize our waterfront at Ontario Place, move the science center out of Flemington and Thorncliffe Parks. And ultimately, he cannot get away with selling our green belt to his donors. It should be a gift to our kids. And I'm going to actively intervene to protect it. He's going to see us be a partner and set our boundaries. And I believe that by doing so, we're in a better place to negotiate for funding for transit, for social housing, because he won't just be able to roll over us the way that he's done over the past few years. He'll know that there are going to be consequences if he doesn't step up and, you know, actually behave the way that a premier should. All right. I'm going to move on to the commute and congestion yes. here in the city. Uh, your plan includes rebuilding the portion of the garden or the elevated portion actually on ground level. Yes. How do you think <clears throat> that will actually improve congestion because there are critics that say that is actually just going to add to the congestion that yes. we're seeing. We're already seeing heavy backup on the lakeshore as it is. How do you put the gardener now onto that? Now, ironically, experts agree with me and the critics are people who are running against me. So I, you know, I accept that they would criticize. That's their job. Some are drivers as well who are skeptical of that plan. 
uh, people are skeptical of a lot of things. I'm just saying that experts yeah. recognize that what I'm proposing makes sense because people have been told that there's a debate about whether or not this two kilometer stretch of the Eastern Gardener past Cherry to the Don is going to come down. The truth is, it is going to come down because it's crumbling. It's either going to be deliberately taken down or it'll fall down on our heads when we're driving under it. That's the reality. So we need to make a choice about when we rebuild it, do we put it up in the air or do we put it on the ground? If we put it on the ground, we're still going to connect the DVP to the rest of the gardener, but we can save over $560 million. That way we can improve affordable housing, we can actually build it, we can build transit, we can move forward with building the Eglinton uh, East LRT in Scarborough, we can extend Shepherd to Nielsen, we can connect transit up to Malvern, we can move forward with building the Waterfront LRT, we can start managing our budget better. And the reality is the, the life cycle, meaning the maintenance costs of an elevated expressway like they used to build in the 1950s is so much more expensive than building it at ground level. So this debate is not about whether or not the gardener needs to be rebuilt in the east. It's about the best way to do it. And I'm proposing a pragmatic way to make sure that we save money, we do it efficiently, and here's the, here's the real clincher. My plan builds it quicker than the elevated plan, meaning that those of you who are coming in from the east will actually have less traffic congestion over many years if we go with the plan that I'm proposing. All right, I'm gonna move on as well to public safety. And this is a Twitter question from a viewer named GZ. We asked Twitter Hello, uh, what GZ. they thought. And first off saying, how can you stop violence on the TTC? You know, the violence on the TTC is affecting so many people. I know so many people who are just like, they're taking Uber, they won't take the TTC anymore. Mm -hmm. And when John Tory and council cut the TTC, it made it less safe. There were more delays. Imagine, you know, how does it make it safer for you if you're waiting on the platform or for your bus longer in the dark? I mean, that's just, that's bonkers, it's wrong. It's a bad way to improve the, the transit system. So we need to make sure that we reverse the cuts to the TTC, that's the first thing I'm gonna do. And then ultimately we need um, experts who are trained in de-escalating individuals with the potential of violence. Um, mental health crisis workers, people who know how to do that job well. And ultimately, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that if they're working with transit control, that they're visible on the transit system, that that will affect safety immediately um, on, on, the, on the routes that we use every single day. Now, ultimately, the longer term plan is that we need to invest in the root causes of violence, whether it be trauma and mental health, poverty, access to housing, racism. There are so many reasons why there are people who are not well in our society. And I just wish that 20 years ago that Mike Harris and others hadn't cut a lot of the supports because, you know, the violence that we're experiencing, the homelessness that we're experiencing didn't just happen. There were intentional decisions and we're experiencing the consequences today. My job as mayor is to not just look at the election cycle, but think ahead to make sure that we have a healthier and safer society for everyone. All right, Councillor Josh Matlow, thank you so much for joining us here on BT this morning. We appreciate it. And once again, June, June 26th is election day. Coming up in less than half an hour's time, we are going to have Mark Saunders here on the couch as well. The final one-on-one -on -one that we're having with the leading candidates. And for more, and you want to look back at any of the interviews that we have had throughout the week, you can just scan that QR code there on your screen.